Well, this evening, we're going to look at giving something up. And I think, you know, very possible as we've continued through the book of Matthew, uh, continue with that uh, process again this evening. And uh, this morning, we looked at the beginning of chapter 19. Now we're going to look at the end of Matthew 19, the second half of it, and even into chapter 20. Uh, not going to get deep into the parable on chap the first of chapter 20, because we're dealing with parables on Wednesday night, but it fits right into this segment, so we'll take a look at it, because I started looking at this lesson here and reading through this passage, and I saw a theme of things, and I thought I'd try and compare that to some of these different elements. So we have the rich young ruler, we have the apostles, and then we have the parable about the laborers, and each of them talk about things that we must do, an action of some sort, it looks at the attitude behind that action of why are we doing it, what's our motivation, and then what's the result when we get to the end. And I think a very good idea to look at all aspects because, you know, we see a finish line at the end of a race, but what's it for? How do we get there? What's the process for doing it? You know, and it's always interesting to look at why are you doing this? You know, when I ask a, a group of uh, scouts at Merritt Batch College in the first weekend in January every year, I'm there to teach emergency preparedness. And I ask the scouts, why are you here? Any answer is okay. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Some are there because they were told to be. Some are there because it's a required. And some are there because they're interested. Okay, the number that are there because they're interested is the lowest number out of all three options. However, they are there, and the question is, will you engage in the class? And as long as you do, then we're good. For us in our spiritual life, there are things that we must do, and yes, there are things we must do. But they're all, there's a reason behind it. Why are we doing them? You know, we've seen throughout that there's been a lot of times that they do it because what I call is the checklist. You know, do this, don't do this, yeah, 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 we got those covered. But Jesus is bringing about this idea of why. And so we start digging into it a little bit. I, you know, Maybe we'll see a little bit something inside of these three examples. So as we look through them, what is the motivation behind and what is it that they're doing? As we start looking at the rich young ruler, we start to see that um, he comes to Jesus in verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may inherit, that I may have eternal life? First, I want to stop and say that finally, Jesus, it is recorded that Jesus is being asked a question that is worth asking. It's not one of these that we've looked at time and time again, where it's the Pharisees trying to trick Jesus or trap him, but we have someone coming with a genuine question, wanting an answer. He's like, what must I do? instead of, let's go trap him. So I applaud this rich young ruler for it. You know, it's interesting that we always call it the rich young ruler, but nowhere in Matthew does it, does it call him a ruler. But when we look at the parallels in Mark and then Luke, Luke records that ruler aspect, so we bundle it together to get the full picture. Christ returns his answer to him and says in verse 17, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So we see the idea that Jesus gives here. We first see the actions of this uh, rich young ruler. He recognizes Jesus as good. So to do that, we saw a few verses back, or uh, almost a few chapters by now, is that when Christ asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? So, you know, falling off of uh, this afternoon is it's all the same text, it's all the same thing. You know, we look at, you know, the only way to know that is to evaluate what they know of the old scriptures and what they see in front of them. And he recognizes Jesus as good. So his action is that he must have been listening and following him to know that aspect. We also see that, you know, in his response here in verse 20, he says, all these things I have kept from my youth. Actually, before we get to that verse, we got to ask, he asked, which ones? Which commandments should I keep? And Jesus takes and lists all of the 
commandments that deal with other people. He skipped over the first four and went straight to six through uh, ten. He looked at all of our interactions with each other. And he says, I've done all these. I've not committed murder. I've not committed adultery. I've not stolen. I have not bore false witness. I've honored my mother, my mother and my father and loved my neighbor as myself. So in this case, he says, I have done the checklist. I've done the things that I'm either supposed to do. I've not done the other things. And he comes back to Christ and says, all these I've kept from my youth. What do I still lack? You ever been in a situation where you've gone through the list, you've gone through your routine, whatever it is, and you get to the point, it's like, am I missing something? Am I missing something? You know, we're looking at our Christian life, we're looking at our jobs, we're looking at whatever it is. What am I missing? I feel like there's something not here. And this ruler comes to Christ and says, what am I missing? Wouldn't it be great to have that kind of a faith, have that kind of an, a desire to be pleasing to God that we want to ask the question, first, what must I do? And second, is there anything I'm missing? And Jesus says to him in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, complete, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. He asked, what must I do to get to heaven? And Christ now tells him here, this is the part you're missing. Sell what you have, let go of the treasures you have now, so that you may have treasure later on. Unfortunately, that garage sale is closed. He does not go and put up a for sale sign. He does not start giving to everybody because we see this in verse 22. When the young man heard the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I started thinking about this before uh, getting up here this evening, and it's like it keeps talking about a young man with great possessions. So I'm wondering how much of this did he physically acquire or how much of this was an inheritance. Either way, the belongings are now his to do with as he pleases. What will we do with what we have? He has decided that the treasures on earth are too much to let go of. You know, in comparison to all these things that we have, he just can't let go. There's that one thing that holds us back. How true is that of our daily lives? How true is it of that that we just can't quite let it go are we able to when we're confronted with the truths of God's word when he says this is what we must do will we do it even if it means letting go of all of our things will we give it up after he went away sorrowful in verse, start going, continuing to 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this is nowhere to scale as far as the sewing needle uh, and a camel, but it still gives the point. That camel ain't making it through the eye of that needle. Uh, we can take uh, the camel apart hair by hair and slide each hair through. But I think we're going to have a problem when we get down to the skin or the bones or anything else. It's not going to happen. As we stop and think about this, you know, we have to continue reading. Because the disciples are questioning this. If, if How then is anything possible? How are we going to get to heaven? And if they ask that question, who then can be saved? And Jesus says, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Did Christ not just tell them a few chapters ago that you know they have to have the faith of a mustard seed, and you can tell this mountain to move and do this and that? I don't think we're physically going to just come over here and tell this building, okay, I want you on the other side of the street, and it's going to happen. The point is, we cannot do this alone. We cannot do this by ourselves. We cannot do this with our own ambitions. We have to be focused on God. 
We have to be focused on him and be able to do that. God can make anything possible. I suppose if he wants to push a camel through the eye of a needle for a party trick to give us entertainment in the afterlife, then he can do that. I'm not going to hold my breath for it because I'm not going to look for it. But the question is, we're not physically able to do this. We're not physically able to work ourselves into heaven. The checklist is not going to get there. There's got to be something more. We have to let go of what we hold inside that is weighing us down. He did not want to sell his possessions because he was covetous of his own possessions. He was focused on the treasures he had here instead of the treasures in heaven. And Christ tried to show him, if you let go of this here and now, you will gain treasures for an eternity, which is what you're asking for. This is how it is done. Unfortunately, he could not do that, at least not at this time, and don't know if he turned around later or not. So if that is the key to going to heaven, is to be able to let go of the things here and now, the apostles turn to him, and Peter asks, uh, answered and said to him, See, we have left all to follow you. Therefore, what shall we have? Now, I started thinking about this statement, and I think of how unfair it is to really be able to just sit and read it, because do we understand the background of what Peter was feeling? What was his intention for asking this? Was he asking this because, hey, we left it all? Or was he truly just asking, Master, we've left all. What about us? You know, we can't see the emotion. We can't see the idea behind it, but the way Jesus answers, I don't think he was puffed up about it. I think he was truly asking, and so in verse 28, he speaks specifically to his disciples, to his closest, and he says, Surely I say to you that in this regeneration, the Son of Man sits on his throne in glory. You will follow me, will also sit on the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So he talks to his closest disciples and tells them they will have a special reward but it won't happen just yet this is we're looking at heaven we're looking at the after we're looking at the regeneration when all things will come when he is on the throne but we also see hope for everyone else for each of us in this room for everyone outside these doors we have the opportunity here and everyone, in verse 29, who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or land for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Are we willing to let go of the things here that hold us back? Are we willing to move forward? We see those that are... You know, they were willing to take and leave their livelihoods. Christ just walked up to him and said, come, follow me. He hadn't even made a big name for himself yet. And he's said, come, follow me. And they did. As they follow Christ, they're able to grow in service to him throughout their entire lives. This does not talk about just being you who have followed me in action. They have to be about the work. And everyone that leaves all of these things for his name's sake, if we leave for Christ's sake, then we're not going to take and uh, walk out for a weekend and, you know, maybe take a weekend getaway and go follow Christ for a weekend and then come back home and forget about Christ. That's not going to cut it. It's not going to work. The result is far better. If we're able to let go of some things now, then we can receive that honor later on. We can rejoice in our service to God. We can rejoice if we choose to serve Him. He talks about here in verse 30, but many who are first will be last and the last first. One of those, th one of those verses you just have to sit and really think about, at least I had to. And I still don't know if I fully understand it and may not. But I think back to Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, when he's talking with John's disciples who came and he said, more blessed are those that believe in me in the kingdom than John. And John is most blessed among women now, but in the kingdom, 
is more blessed than he. The nation of Israel followed God, mostly, you know, up and down. But I almost wonder if they kind of focused that. The first was the nation of Israel, but they kept on ignoring the prophets. They kept ignoring Christ, all of these things. And then the last. We're not the chosen people, as in you only have a certain geographic area or a certain nation that does it. We choose to follow. And because of that choice, that reward is there. But he is not going to forget the first and those that he has had under his wing the whole time. All that follow him will be rewarded. And we see that because he immediately turns and goes into chapter 20 and starts talking about the parable of the laborers. He starts looking at them and about going out as the master of this vineyard goes out and starts hiring workers at several times throughout the day. He goes out multiple times to a spot that is known to have people in it. He is going and recruiting. He's bringing people in and each person accepts the job that they are offering. And they complete the duties as assigned. What are they doing? They are doing the job before them. Every laborer was promised a day's wage upon hire. They were all said, I'll, I'll hire you for a denarii. They all said, okay, that is acceptable. We will come. Whether they came at 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12, 3, whatever time of the day they were hired, they all came. There's no record in this parable of anyone being unsatisfactory or not or being kicked out for not working. They all came, they all did their job. Until it was time to make payments. The work day is over. Everyone comes and lines up to start getting paid, and then all of a sudden we see something creep in. We see envy start to show up because the people that just showed up to start working and work their time shift versus the people that got there early on and worked all day all received the same wage. They all received that denarius. And some of them were envious because I've worked all day long and they haven't. And they got a denarius? If we go back and think about entry to heaven, and think about our lives, is it not very similar in nature? Some of us have been in the Lord's service longer than others. Does that mean that someone should get a higher reward than the other? Looking at the parable of laborers, it's about service to God. A service. Be in the service. And we'll receive the reward. We'll receive the benefit that is received. We can't push a camel through that eye of a needle. We can be pleasing to God and be able to do what he wants us to do. And if we are, he will give us that reward. I should not be envious of someone else who just becomes a Christian right before the end of time. Or before I die, or if they die minutes after they've become a Christian, why am I going to stand in line looking at the pearly gates saying, well, why is he getting the same reward as me? Is that not what the laborers are doing? The earthly message is about a day's wage, but look at it from the other standpoint. Give up the envy. It doesn't matter how long someone else has been of service or how, if I've been of service longer than you or you of me. Are we serving in the right vineyard with the right tasks at hand? Give up the rest. Give up the self ideas. Give up these things and just be able to accept the wages that have been given us. Just as the rich young ruler had the opportunity to be able to let go of the things here that he needed to, he had the opportunity. He asked Christ directly and got the direct answer. This is what you need to do to get there. The apostles were given that affirmation of this is what you need to continue. The laborers were given the opportunity to work and to receive that which they had. What will we do? It doesn't matter how long we work. The goal is to receive the grace of God and inherit eternal life in heaven. 
with as many others as possible. If we know what uh, corner that this uh, person was coming to to uh, pick up laborers throughout the day, would we not encourage others, hey, do you want to come? I know of this great thing. We all know of this great thing. Will we take advantage of it and help share it with others? But to accomplish this, we must give up some earthly items from being our focus to be able to put that focus on God. Will we do that? Will we let go? Will we learn from this rich young ruler and let go of the earthly things that we need to so that we can focus on the heavenly treasures and rewards? Will we learn from the apostles and the disciples and that promise that he gives that all will be able to come and do the service and be pleasing to God? I look forward to the end day that we're able to take and receive that reward that uh, Christ has told us about, that God has promised us from the very beginning of time. Will we be ready when it comes? The only way to be ready is to give up a few things here. Have we already done it? Is there anything else we need to give up? If there is, we offer an invitation for anyone that needs to help give up something or help uh, need help along the pathway. If there's anything we can do to be of assistance, let us know while together we stand.